Thank you. Good afternoon. I have uh, 20 minutes to talk to you about the importance of data. And uh, I love the slide that Father Matthew actually showed, which links data with decision making, uh, which is for all leaders, the most important job. I face that in my job all the time. Uh, and, and what I usually fall back on is data because data is, this, this sums up the importance of data. In God we trust, but all others must bring data. So this is said by a gentleman, William Edwards Deming, who was uh, known most for quality and statistics. He in fact was somebody who taught the Japanese about quality. So a statistician who relied on data to do his job. So this sort of sums up um, you know, what the importance of, of data is, is, is in all our lives, whether we choose to use it or not is, is up to us. And today, at the end of this session, I hope to convert a lot of you to that stream of decision making where you use data as evidence so that your chances of going wrong are reduced quite a lot. Look at these headlines. And this is again gonna give you a little bit of a gist of the importance of data, okay? Look at some of the bold ones. Healthcare organizations deem data security compliance as a leading factor in hybrid cloud adoption. Look at this, data center may become India's economic growth engine, likely to generate large scale investments, jobs. Data is an economic resource. Gopal Krishnan committee report shows how its value can be shared, governed. Today, data is almost like oil was for, for combustible engines. Very, very important for all our companies. We have, like Sri Watson said, a lot of data amidst us. I'm sure all of you have a lot of data, but what do you do with that data? And that is what is important. What I wanna do is share a small video of how data has shaped key events in our lives. And what I hope, what I hope to do then is, is talk to you about some, you know, show you some companies, talk to you about how data is useful in healthcare, and then maybe show you some examples from Philips. So I'm not marketing Netflix over here, but for those of you who have Netflix, or those of you who have heard, okay, of Cambridge Analytica, will relate well with this. It's a two minute video. I hope you're able to see this and hear it properly. Who has seen an advertisement that has convinced you that your microphone is listening to your conversations? All of your interactions, your credit card swipes, web searches, locations, likes, they're all collected in real time into a trillion dollar a year industry. The real game changer was Cambridge Analytica. They worked for the Trump campaign and for the Brexit campaign. They started using information warfare. Cambridge Analytica claimed to have 5,000 data points on every American voter. I started tracking down all these Cambridge Analytica ex-employees. Someone else that you should be calling to the committee is Brittany Kaiser. Brittany Kaiser, once a key player inside Cambridge Analytica, casting herself as a whistleblower. The reason why Google and Facebook are the most powerful companies in the world is because last year data surpassed oil in value. Data is the most valuable asset on earth. Targeted those whose minds we thought we could change until they saw the world the way we wanted them to. I do know that their targeting tool was considered a weapon. There is a possibility that the American public has been experimented on. This is becoming a criminal matter. When people see the extent of the surveillance, I think they're going to be shocked. And I still fear for your life. Yeah, like the powerful people that are involved. But I can't keep quiet just because it'll make powerful people mad. 
data rights should be considered just fundamental rights. This is about the integrity of our democracy. These platforms which were created to connect us have now been weaponized. It's impossible to know what is what because nothing is what it seems. So I'm not sure how many of you have already seen uh, this particular movie, but this talks about the power of data. It talks about what we can do with data. And you heard the, the video. It talks about the Trump, the, you know, the, the US elections. It talks about the Brexit vote as well. And the amount of data that um, exists between us, amidst us, okay, can do, can do a lot, uh, can, can move mountains actually. So I'm just gonna move my slide. I'm sorry, just give me one second, guys. I seem to be missing one slide. Never mind. I'll just talk through it. What I wanted to talk, what I wanted to show you, the slide that I wanted to show you was actually a picture of the top 500 companies. So uh, the top 25 companies in the world. Okay, and the top five companies are companies that you will recognize. These are like Google, Amazon, Facebook. Okay, now these are companies that make their fortunes. These have become the top companies only because of data, only because of data. Now, let me quickly show you a few examples of your day-to-day -day life and how data is used. What you have over there is a basic Google search predictable search. Now, if you notice on the screen, what's typed so far is just cuff and run, two words. And it automatically gives you a whole lot of suggestions. Cuff, runny nose, runny nose, no fever, runny nose, fever, nose diarrhea, nose fever talk. It tries to look at what you have searched before and not just you, what the rest of the people using Google are searching today. And it automatically predicts data. Look at this. How many of us have used Google Maps? Now I've got what I've got on the Google map over there right now is going from RK Puram to the Delhi station. And if you can look at it, it has suggested several routes. Okay. This is RK Puram and I'm going to Delhi station. Yes. It has plotted the lowest time, lowest uh, route, lowest time taking route at this point in time. But you see all these gray lines out there. These are all alternate routes. And at other times of the day, this might, there might be more optimal routes to take. How do you do that? Data. Everybody who's using their phones, using Google, is sending data to the cloud to talk about how the traffic conditions are. Who has bought stuff on Amazon? Look at that. We're looking for the Philips hair flattener over here. You know, the top row of uh, sort of products that you see over there. Philips hair flatteners. Okay, now it automatically chooses to show you inspired by your purchases. Okay, so people who bought that, customers who viewed this item also viewed, shows you some more data. Frequently bought together, what is the bundling? They are making use of data to make it more convenient to consumers. Stock market, who doesn't know the stock market? Now, the Reliance share is doing quite well. Yes, it's doing quite well right now. Okay, that's the left part of the screen. Look at the right part of the screen. That's analytics. That's predictive analytics saying, hey, where is the share price going to be in the next two months, in the next six months, in the next 12 months? Okay, so if you see all around us, Netflix, Prime Video, a lot of this is based on predictive sort of analytics and what they use is data. Data of what you are generating and data that other people are generating, okay? This is a slide I was looking for. I'm sorry, I forgot the chronology of my sites. But can you look at this? All of these brands are definitely recognizable by you. These are the top 25 in terms of market cap, okay? These are the Fortune 500 top 25 fortune 500 now look at the top look at the top row out there microsoft apple amazon alphabet it's google facebook 
okay? All these are essentially data companies. They make their business on data. They are able to become successful because of data. So in this institute, in this network of your hospitals, you too can become absolutely successful if you leverage the power of data. So this is other than healthcare. Let's look at what's happening in healthcare. How do we make the shift from intuitive to data-driven decision-making in healthcare? And that's where I said that slide that, doc, that, that Father Matthew showed was so powerful. You must use data for your decision-making. All of us have led their lives in, in different ways, and all of you have, and you use intuition quite a lot. When we are discussing about this, uh, about this particular conference, uh, I think Dr. Bina mentioned, you know, how she's been using intuition. Somebody says, hey, take a free equipment, donate it. And she was very happy, but her finance director said, hey, hang on, there is a cost to this, okay? There is a cost to this. Let's look at data. If you take on other free equipment, that's going to result in more cost at the end of the year. Is that what you really want? And then you say, hey, okay, let me hang on. Let me analyze this a little bit more. Let me look at data a little bit more. So you're going to recognize a whole lot of these boxes that I have on the slide over here. Viability assessment of new investments. Dr. Veena's example. Due diligence for strategic partnerships. You want to partner with another hospital. You want to partner with another organization. You need to look at data. Performance of sales, performance of costs. Things that obviously your finance department is going to be very, very uh, adept at doing. But more, more about what you can do. Enhance patient engagement. If you are able to capture data for all your patients and not just keep it on, on, on paper, like I was told, I was told by uh, you know, St. John's Hospital in Bangalore, they've got reams and reams of paper with, with patient information, but that's on pieces of paper. How can I get more meaning out of that? You have to make it electronic. How do you make it electronic? And once you make it electronic, then I think you can get a lot of patient insight from that. And that can be used for patient engagement. You can predict what's happening to people, okay? From data that they've been collecting about their vital statistics, their wearables, all of these give data. How can you use that to engage your patients better? How do you improve patient monitoring? This is something that Father Johnson from, from Rajagiri Hospital, who's here, he knows uh, about the ICU solution. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, just show you what that solution looks like. Where in an ICU, instead of doing paper charting, how can you elect make it all electronic? How can you make normal algorithms to look at the different combination of data that those monitors are providing for the patient and have an early warning system, a red flag? not wait for people to come across and notice what's written down on a piece of paper and then take a decision because those patients in the ICU are mostly not reactive. Predictive analytics, that's what this ICU solution uses as well. Medication errors. If you have electronic data, they can flag up these errors very easily. Real-time emergency alerts. This is what I was saying when different data which for humans, it only comes with intuition. Here you can put algorithms in there where either they take your SpO2, their heart rate, your blood pressure, all kinds of things, your cranial pressure, pressure. Depending on the type of patient that you have in an ICU, the combination of these data can actually tell you if you're looking at something in the future, which you can prevent right now by some medication, right? Community health outcomes. Again, you can take all the patients in your hospital and have them fill out forms that talk about their vital statistics. You can, especially in these times like COVID, you have the Arogya Setu app that does exactly the same thing. It's able to say what's happening in the community and then, and then district administrations are able to take actions based on those. So a lot can be done in healthcare. A lot of papers written out there. I'm gonna show you a few solutions that we have in Philips, 
I think I've got five more minutes and I should be able to give you very brief, very brief glimpses of what some of those are. Here's the first one, something Father Johnson actually has, has, has an experience with. It's called the ICA solution or the IntelliSpace Critical Care and Anesthesia Solution. It is, like I said, a paperless, it's a solution for paperless ICU. You don't have to have paper charts hanging on every ICU bed where a nurse has to go around filling out snapshots of what the reading is on the monitors at that time. It gives you the trend lines, it gives you the charts, and the intensivists can access this remotely. Okay, let me, let me show you a couple of more. Vital Health. This is, the, this is the solution that I said, where you can collect data for your own patients that come to the hospital. We can get predictive scores out of this and call in patients, reach patients, okay, in advance before a calamity hits them, okay? Now, if anybody's interested in these, please do reach out to me separately so that I can give you some more details. These are all hospital-based solutions. Performance bridge. In a hospital which has got a huge network or hospital networks as huge as yours, we can very easily look at dashboards of what your imaging equipment is doing. And we can talk about what is a baseline everybody needs to perform above. You can notice who's not performing to the baseline and provide training, provide the right protocols, okay? This is the last one. Compressed sense. This is true artificial intelligence. Okay. This is where an MRI, usually you can do about 30 to 40 MRIs in a day. But if you have a lot of crowd, can you make it up to 50% faster, do about 60 patients? Yes, you can. We use data to automatically recognize which part of the body is being scanned, what is the kind of scan, and then only scan the important elements and not the entire cross-section of the body at that space. This is able to make us go faster. So a lot of solutions out there that can make your life easier. But the lesson over here is use data and your life will definitely get easier in your decision making. Thank you very much. Over to you, Shri Watson. Thank you, Rohit, for uh talking on such a wide spectrum, right from the way that um, the world's leading companies are using data and then bringing it down to saying, what are the ways that hospitals can use data? So surely the folks on the call would have gotten a good sense of the opportunities to leverage data. I want to now request uh, Dr. Vijay Aruldas to share his views on this, Vijay. Um, is my screen showing? Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Srivatsan. Thank you, Father Alex and others. It's a privilege to be here to walk you through a few perspectives briefly on how we can leverage data. Um, financial sustainability, leveraging data. I'm looking at four areas, clinical performance, operational performance, patient engagement, and financial management. There could be other areas, but just to give you a feel of where the possibilities lie. And my focus is largely on helping you just to get an overview. There is a certain flow which is useful to look at when you're looking at uh, leveraging data. One is to understand what are we analyzing. So I've listed these four areas. For each of these areas, we pick up uh, ratios or uh, measures we want and the targets we want to achieve in them. I'll give some examples, but I'll walk you through in more detail. To understand those, we have reports or dashboards, which could be live dashboards or periodic reports, which can look at periodic growth, which could highlight deviations, which could be visualized for better interpretation. Importantly, we should also have a way of following up, performance review, actionables with accountability and timelines, maybe set up empower teams to take up priority areas emerging from our analysis 
or do further analysis data if required. And this would help to get data leveraged adequately and not just available for reading. Just a few examples uh, in clinical performance. Uh, many of you would already know things like this, the C-sections, the uh, clean uh, wounds, the ventilator, clean wound infections, ventilator, pneumonias, catheterization, post-catheterization, urinary tract infections in ICUs. These are typical departmental level clinical issues. And it's important that our hospitals have that. This would be the prerogative of the clinicians or the nursing team there. And they would, uh, the whole care team would come up with indicators. It's important that those are developed, fostered, addressed as well. Outpatient area is not so easy, but in chronic illnesses, there are some, for example, diabetes. And here, I'm just introducing the idea of process indicators and outcome indicators. So in diabetes, which all of us know about, there's a rate of HP1AC testing. We'd like every patient coming in to be tested to have a, a dilated ophthalmoscopic examination and a foot examination. Believe me, in even diabetes centers or ophthalmology centers, this is not happening. And we've done uh, studies which show that. And the outcome should obviously be that sugars are controlled, that people don't go into retinopathy and very few develop foot ulcers. Another big area is many of our hospitals will have clinical practice guidelines, which we've developed or we picked up. And once we have it in place, we let it be like that. So understanding what percentage, for example, of LSCS or cesareans have followed guidelines or documented deviations gives us the feeling how our clinical performance is going. And then there are sentinel events, which are these unexpected occurrence, death, physical, serious injury, injuries, which we'd want to keep track of. So these are some of the examples of clinical performance indicators, data we can use to leverage for better performance. Resources, utilization and productivity is what we typically look at. We look at diagnostic uh, facilities, theaters, OPs, beds, uh, length of stay, occupancy, surgical volumes, by equipment, which equipment is doing better, which equipment is doing worse. I don't know how many of us dig deeper into these issues, but that's an area, especially as hospitals get more complex, we should actually be looking at it at a micro level. Another area which we perhaps don't look at much is peak time management. There are peaks and there are lows of, of any facility, of any resource. So balancing demand supply, making sure that it meets the demand as required is something we need to do. Waiting times is the bane of all our hospitals, time to get appointments, pre-consultation, wait in the OP, waits in emergencies, admission from emergency, discharge billing times. Again, some institutions do, don't. It's a matter of choosing which ones we do, but all of these are crucial if we are moving to operational performance. Um, patient engagement. Uh, ensuring patient satisfaction. If we are into getting referrals from physicians, analyzing that, also having data on how well we facilitate that to happen. Patient demographics is something we rarely look at, though we have a way, that information with us. Patient flow or the market share from established areas uh, and from newer areas. Sometimes we think we need a lot of data for this, but you know, some time ago I was working with a small rural hospital in Orissa in a tribal area, 50 beds for 50% occupancy. They had some ideas on why things were not happening. So as I was there, we looked at it, talked to the patients. They said they came in because they had been to the OP or they had others who had come here. So we picked out their uh, OP data for about six months and mapped it out on a, on a local map. And we found that apart from the surrounding areas, there were certain pockets from where people actually came. So the decision was then to look at those pockets, look at the weekly markets there, set up clinics there so that more people would come in. And following that path of where patients were coming from, they went further into newer areas along the highway, along the bus route and set up weekly market clinics as well. So this was a use of data to be able to analyze where and therefore establish a better patient flow and engagement from there. So it doesn't always need high-end data, but it needs asking the right questions and finding ways to get the data. Financial management always has a whole lot of indicators. There are uh, revenue indicators of outpatient, inpatient surgeries, emergencies, diagnostics, what have you. But going a little deeper, we could look at average revenue per bed of different categories of bed that we have. We can look at the margins that we make, and especially in the earning departments like pharmacy, laboratory, et cetera. In pharmacy, there are fast moving, slow moving items. So do we have an understanding of the margins from those? Which ones can we tweak a little more so that Though it's fast moving, we may actually be, because it's fast moving, we may be able to do with a 
lesser margin, a quicker flow and get more of a revenue. So those are managerial decisions if we have that kind of data to look at. Um, and budget versus revenue, cost budget, so on. Another area which doesn't get addressed most, uh, more and even in more urban hospitals is the where the money is coming from. Is it self-paying? If it's self-paying, what are they using? Because customer use of patient use of payment modes are changing and to gear up to what they need and what they're willing to do, we want to make it easier for them. So if our patients are more into online payment, the Paytm, et cetera, are we gearing ourselves to that? Do we know what's happening so that we make it easier for them? Revenues by geography, understanding where our money is coming from. We know the numbers, but do we know our revenues? And this helps us also as another input into our decision-making of data. Looking at costs is important. Increasingly, I hope each of us have moved into some kind of costing exercise where we've understood the actual costs, but looking at that and understanding what we are spending on manpower and other aspects, how is it actually affecting our revenue and our utilization? We could also use this to pick up specific projects every year with separate tracking just to make sure we actually have cost savings. But if we don't have the data, we'll neither know where we are starting nor we are finishing. Charity analysis is something which really doesn't get enough attention. Where are patients coming from? Which activity areas in the hospital department's procedures are uh, utilizing more of the charity? And where are our support for charity coming from? Uh, individuals versus institutions, supporters profile, giving analysis. That's an old area which we need to grow stronger in as we seek to reach out more for external support. Some common sense about data. Data only captures what's designed to capture. So, you know, one of the favorite sayings is garbage in, garbage out. So when you see data and you doubt it, it's good to go back to see what it's capturing, how the data was captured and be assured, reassured that actually it's saying what it's saying. The label may be different from the actual indicator. So please do be careful there. We must realize the real of data, value of data doesn't lie in the data itself. It's in the way we interpret and we use it. And if we are not using data, collecting the data can be a waste of effort. So we need to constantly revise and see, do we really need to have all the data coming in? Are we using it in some way? Could we use it better? Uh, some of the challenges we have when we are uh, using data um, sometimes we just don't use the indicators. And so while they are there, they become ignored and because they're not acted upon. And I've come across so many hospitals where, for example, lab data has total volumes, but nobody really asks the question of what is happening within the lab, which equipment is doing better, which test is more frequently done. If the test falls, why is it falling? That is the part of data which helps us to go back and see what's happening, what's changing, where are the ways we need to improve in small places in larger places, there are more things we can do with the data itself. Um, another issue is quite often you'll find the decisions are based on strongly held opinions, ignoring data and using data when it suits our understanding. I'm sure all of you would have examples or experiences like that. Uh, the drawback is that when we ignore the data, the people providing the data stop looking at it so carefully. The group starts, stops looking at the data because they find that the leader doesn't really base decisions on data. So even if we have a strong opinion, it's important that we justify it using data as leaders. A big challenge is you look at single events and we quickly react to it rather than assessing the system issues. Uh, this happened just about three weeks ago in one of the areas I look after, you know, nowadays with WhatsApp photos go. So an area heavily crowded, sensitive area, photos all around the place, everybody jumped on me and said, get more doctors, get more equipment, more computers, don't worry, money is not an issue. But the actual issue was two services provided side by side with an overlap of about 60 patients, 60% 60 of patients using both, not enough waiting areas. Luckily, it was a Monday issue, you know, Mondays are busy. So by the time the next Monday came, we had time to clear up a new area for waiting, set up a separate waiting area, escort patients in a few at a time to make it happen. And not only did the pace, place become uh, smooth and quiet, also the workers there worked faster because they were not... Uh, disturbed so much. Pick fix solutions based on personal understanding of the problem. I don't know how many meetings I've sat off where the leader says, based on my experience, this is what we should be doing. And looking at the data, we know it's going to address only a small percent of, percent of the problem. The improvements we make are satisfying, but really the change is very little. And so we need to keep going back to looking at data. 
course, within hospitals and organizations, the silo culture also makes it difficult because you work in different silos, integration is an issue. But these are the, some of the ways in which we are challenged when we use data. Therefore, we need to build a culture of using data. And how do we do that? We may ourselves not be data people, but we can. And we are, uh, you know, I think as, as leaders, it's our mandate to get people to think data and use data. Getting buy-in, top-down, bottom-up. At the departmental level, people are willing to, if they ask the right questions, they are willing to look at data and provide it for justification, for analysis, for progression, for, you know, what's happening. They will find data and we need to ask the right questions and show them how it can be meaningful. Of course, once we show data, more questions will come, but that's all part of the uh, excitement which happens. Um, one of the areas, uh, you know, again, this since I managed the OP, there are a few questions come up was, you know, um, data needs to be meaningful to people, easily understandable. It's not always good to have good numbers. So we had a constant problem in one area where there were three parallel counters, always a big queue, you know, suddenly jumps up, everybody hits the, hits the panic button. But putting an alarm system was just not working out possible. Looking for numbers, queue length, didn't really make sense. Finally, what we did was this. We, we mapped out the area. The third was, you know, another pillar. And so we said if there's pillars, um, pillar one, uh, no, so the open area one, pillar one is level two, pillar two is level three. And that cleared up the whole system because there was common agreement in how to interpret the data. Data thinking persons. In our hospitals, there are often not many. And you yourself may not be one. I am somewhat there, but not really fully there. And so it's, you'll find people in the hospital who will be data thinking persons. Bring them into the group because they will ask those questions. Technology, most of us have computerized systems to some level, at least registration, uh, lab, investigations, maybe EMR also. Look at collaborating with nearby colleges, student projects to get it going. In my earlier stint in Velo, when I was looking at the medical records and the whole inpatient, you know, deficiency check of charts, uh, uh, coding, uh, completion, etc. We had students coming in on MCA projects and we developed our whole internal system out of that. Later, the IT team came and revised it. Visualization helps because not everybody understands numbers, graphs, maps, cataplots. I am an honorary treasurer for an international Christian organization. And so I present the budget and I present numbers like on the left side of the screen, you know, budgets, actuals, different colors. And I'm very happy with these numbers. And after I present this, the CEO comes up with this nice little box with, you know, pie diagrams with diagrams. And straight away, everybody understands that better path better than they could mine. And so that's an important lesson for me there. You know, data visualization helps to make sense better than numbers, based obviously on the numbers. So when we have so much data to handle, how do we choose our data? So my preference is for looking at high volume areas, high cost areas, high risk areas, and problem prone areas. Pick those and look at it and do the whole analysis across, whether it's operational issue, clinical performance issue, finance issue, costing issue, patient engagement, Look at that area because you're not trying to solve an operations problem. You're trying to make sure that the system works well. So that is where you cut across the silos and make it happen. And if you find that you've got the data right and it's working well, and it's then reduce the frequency. Don't keep going at it again and again because people will get worried and move your attention to something else. Um, Data mining is one area now which has come up recently, which essentially looks at large amounts of data sets and finds a way to you know, get effective treatments, best practices, develop guidelines, uh, what is more affordable for patients, how do we identify patients who are you know, going in for heart failure or for a respiratory um, distress and then be able to predict what's going to happen and go ahead. Of course, it also helps us to understand customers and where they come from and what their preferences are. And in the system, we can look at waste as well. We picked up, I think, at different times, not with the large-scale data mining, but we picked up uh, fraud happening, uh, people stealing uh, batteries or, you know, in the ex old X-ray system, um, filching silver and things like that. So there are ways to look at that, and data mining helps to make that happen. Finally, as a network, there's power in your hands, and you really need to make that happen. Benchmarking is a good opportunity, whether it's clinical operation, financial parameters. Two quick examples on pharmacy. One group looked at pharmacy turnover and profits, looked at the best performer, was zealous, 
and kind of you know intrigued why it was happening they went and checked and found that they were buying the cheapest drugs regardless of the brand when they applied the relevant brand brand cost it was found to be on par with the second best performer but there were people lower down the line who had to sort out their reordering levels their stocking levels and their purchase uh, processes as well another group we looked at different hospitals within about 300 kilometers well connected tamil nadu karnataka same brand different prices across all the hospitals interesting the largest volume uh, purchaser did not have the cheapest cost so there are lot of eye opening issues of course comparing clinical performance is always uh, possible diabetes control lscs rates clean wound infection so on but that is something which is important because we are going ahead on this to advocate and negotiate with government and insurers pharmaceutical companies is an important area for um, data uh, one of our mission hospital the cma hospitals in orissa uh, in a particular district the strength sent fair percent of the lscs in that district despite a government medical college there this we picked up when we were looking at the clinical establishment act like just before it came out to try and argue for a differential uh, you know way of looking at our group of cma and chai hospitals of course the tb and malaria care is well known but again providing the data on that is important costing is increasingly crucial insurance is going to move towards caps now the reimbursement era flat reimbursement era is going to decrease even now the various schemes chief minister and pm are moving towards that so it's we must know our co- costs to survive and to bargain we need to compare benchmark look who's doing cheaper why and see what we can learn from that the challenge is that our data systems are different our uh, structures of our accounting systems are different so we need to have some alignment at least in data capturing and that we can do through specific projects which are funded to make that happen research is a big area chai has so many research institutions so can they have a policy that in every research project network participation is is uh, is um, added on so that shows their institutional commitment and individuals will emerge from the network it needs facilitation probably from chai side but these projects i care diabetes etc also help to bring alignment can strengthen internal systems one of the hospitals i'm on the board is has got a, had got a huge grant for infrastructure the grant required a lot of reporting and a lot of detailed ratios so they slowly and gradually brought it into the hospital the hospital didn't have the kind of where with all the the staff capacity to straight away move but the project had and so through this project they brought in that strengthening gradually so that there was a learning opportunity for the staff to actually make that happen data for action we know collaborations already group purchase, purchasing you are doing and that's a that's a great thing which is happening linking diagnostic will happen whether it's reporting or reagents or equipping purchasing negotiations all of these are things which can happen as a network sharing clinical strengths cardiologists uh, and others plastic surgeons linking facilities theater space cmc itself in vellore uh, takes up theater space from three surrounding hospitals because there isn't enough here but there is so much which can happen in this way and therefore when we share we can look at cost reduction productivity and other good practices so leveraging data rests in our hands individually and collectively we can make it happen we must make it happen thank you hey vijay thank you you took exactly 20 minutes and you oh. packed in such an amazing amount of things that is possible to do with is such an amazing amount of stuff that it is possible to do and i think that uh, there is a lot of food for thought in this for uh, all the participants to go back because there is so much granular application that you have suggested so thank you very much for that and uh, i'm hoping there will be questions at the end um, i'd like to now request uh, dr fernandez to share her experiences of uh, using data in her institutions dr fernandez yeah i'll just just get the powerpoint up yeah oh. can you see my screen not yet ma'am no? not yet sorry just give me a second sorry i need to share the screen yeah okay right yes yes now we can all right let's put it on slide yeah oops 
Yeah, thank you very much for, for the privilege, Father Matthew. And thank you, Rohit and Vijay. I loved your talks and particularly Vijay because I could resonate with a lot of things that you mentioned. Um, because as an obstetrician, we were not trained for this. In the last four or five years, using analytics and data has changed my thinking and perspective. Uh, just for those in the audience who don't know, we are about a 72-year-old institute with uh, three hospitals of 100 beds each, two OP outlets, a dedicated center for Fernandez Child Development Center, and recently introduced a mom and baby store because we do about 10,000 babies um, a year annually. Well, pre-COVID, this was our waiting spaces, and I'm sure all of you can understand that. Post-COVID, you've reduced because you've got to maintain physical distance. And this will certainly impact the volumes and your ability to sustain your services. So uh, when the lockdown happened, uh, the first thing we did was we were grateful that we had switched to EMR, electronic medical records, um, several years ago, almost two decades ago. So we realized that we had <laughs> appointments booked till the 15th of April. On an average, we have about 800 to 900 footfalls in the outpatients per day. And on a Saturday, that could go beyond 1,200. So very quickly, all the doctors and whoever could help, ward secretaries, receptionists, made calls. But essentially, the calls were made by the doctors to reach out to women, couples, mothers-to-be, saying, look, we, we can talk to you, we can handle you, don't worry, we will sort you out and you know things like that. The fetal medicine department very quickly identified critical mothers uh, who needed um, ultrasound and we had to reorganize about 3000 ultrasound scan appointments. And of course, very quickly got staff to work from home because we had to use lean staff and created a rapid response team, which again had sub teams to look at what we could do to prepare ourselves for COVID, um, starting from processes, pathways, screening, isolation pathways, uh, teams for getting PEP, uh, PPE, and also training, training constantly, starting from the security guard right up to the doctors. So we spent a lot of time doing that. And fortunately, the Harvard Medical School offered a free um, certified course for those who wanted to learn about telehealth and uh, how to handle phone calls. So we realized this was the order of the day and made it mandatory for everybody who was involved in talking to patients. And between the 5th and 15th of April, we offered free video call service to mothers. And by the 15th, we were ready to start actual video consultation because the lockdown continued um, and at, you know, right up to the end of April. And you can see that your video consults kept increasing every month. And um, today we are at 5,000 video consults, in fact, just at the beginning of July, we had done more than 10,000 video consults between April and June. Um, and this contributes to about 27% of our revenue in outpatient services, because you can imagine the fall that would have occurred because of the lockdown and safety practices. So if you look at where our money goes, manpower is 55%. And in this 55%, 10% are the ones who are on the top, but 90% are people below 50,000 a month. And we had made a conscious decision that that group will not be touched. So we were actually carrying a heavy load. We're very fortunate to have um, dedicated and very committed uh, uh, staff who walked with us for several years. Quite a few of them offered to take a waiver on their salaries in the month of April. Um, a lot of them offered to have pay cuts. So we were forced to actually begin a pay cut in the 10% of the, of the staff. And pay cut depended on the salary 
uh, range range from 5% to about 30%. Our consumables went up because of our PPE. And uh, so therefore the pharmacy consumption and the expenditure of getting PPEs. Rent and utilities, we tried to negotiate with our, uh, you know, people who owned property and where we were leasing our, you know, to run our services. Some of them agreed. And so we did get a bit of a waiver there. Admin expenses overheads contributes to 15% of what we spend. And yes, with, uh, with actually getting people, the non-clinical staff to work from home and shutting down you know, areas of work. And strangely, we realized our data showed that it actually brought down our costs because even things like paper printing, uh, paper mugs for coffee and other things came down. When we looked at our revenue March before COVID uh, lockdown hit us, um, we were at about 91% of our benchmark that we had set for ourselves, which plummeted to 60% because for those the first three weeks of lockdown, almost four weeks, we had shut down all services except emergency services. And in those three weeks, we got our act together on telehealth, on getting in processes, pathways, training, PPE. So when we began to open our outpatient services, which was in May, we were ready with the pathways of, you know, maintaining physical distance and other things. So now we believe that our new normal or our benchmark will probably be hovering around 80%. Because as you notice, our birth rates were almost around, well, definitely over 700. And we would normally have about 800, 850 a month. Post COVID, we are above 700. And some of the reasons is because quite a few of the women went back to their homes out of Hyderabad city, felt safer going back to their homes in smaller towns because Hyderabad very soon became a red zone for COVID. So the new normal, our data shows certainly our OP capacity reduced by 30% because you have to maintain physical distance, you have to make sure. So your volumes that you can actually manage in the same space was, was less. Our lab revenue because almost 27%. I mean, because of our increase in telehealth, the, these patients, they would have otherwise been visiting the hospital and you would have got their you know, revenue, it would impact the lab revenue. So that has gone down while the telehealth went up. Physical OPs dropped by 30%. And about 8% of our mothers, though they would consult us, uh, antenatally, and now with telehealth, antenatal consultation becomes even more easier. Uh, they would birth in their respective places because for some people traveling across the city during lockdown made it difficult. Gynec surgeries and infertility was on hold. Hyderabad had no access to testing. There was no way we could do any elective surgeries. It's only recently that we've been allowed to test private hospitals and private labs have opened up. And uh, so therefore that revenue took, uh, took a beating. And we've now learned that the new normal is your profit margin would certainly be reduced. And that's a reality that we need to accept. But when you've learned to identify and what is important is using technology to the maximum. Uh, our electronic medical record made life so easy. Uh, it helped us to do our video consults. It became almost seamless that you could have your information. Uh, you had the woman first, you know, you had a doctor first consulting her to getting a history. She would upload whatever report she had. So the video consult time was used to the maximum best. And this optimized her physical visit so that we reduced her time out of her home and also in the hospital. 
And decisions were all made based on data, something that I learned to do over the last few years. And I realized that emotions, perceptions, and statements that I would have made in my earlier years out of foolishness in my experience. So I could resonate so well with what you were saying, Vijay, and how data helps us make these decisions. And it helped us identify areas that were certainly not revenue generating. And we decided to cut our losses. Like example, a clear example is just the gynec department because we couldn't offer you know, fertility treatment. The guidelines were not very clear. Everything, we were asked to put things on hold. So all our focus was on birth and uh, obstetrics. So even our doctors uh, who would have otherwise indulged in gynec work began to help out with all the video consults for antenatal care and obstetrics. So we changed our focus. So my message to everybody out there is get data, look at it, and let that influence your decision. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez, for sharing your personal experience. Uh, nothing more impactful than actually seeing how institutions have actually utilized data. And I'm sure that there will be a lot of people pondering what you have uh, told them today. Um, I'd like to now invite Sister Dr. Bina to share uh, her thoughts on this. Sister Dr. Bina? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, and see your slides as well. Thank you. Good evening to one and all. Uh, first of all, I thank today's speakers for such stimulating and enlightening session. Uh, today, I would like to share a few of my own experience in Holy Family Hospital, Mumbai, on how data-driven decision can enhance quality of care to the patients, as well as how it can improve the operational efficiency and financial stability. All of us agree with me that with NABH accreditation, it's mandatory to capture data about 74 key performance indicator. One of it is antibiotic sensitivity pattern in the hospital. Quality team of the hospital analyzes this data every three months. Decision taken based on this data actually gives us a clear idea on what is the antibiotic sensitivity pattern and what is the resistance antibiotics. They further recommend on how, on how the reserve antibiotic, which for example, should be used as last resort antibiotic for next three months. This has reduced the antibiotic resistance in a very, very significant way. In other words, the decision on which antibiotic to be used and which to be kept as reserved is based on the antibiogram chart, which is analyzed by the quality team as well as the infection control team. Data also, if used and analyzed efficiently and decisions taken in time can save lives. Few years ago, we had carried out another audit to find out the timeliness of treatment in patients with myocardial infarction and stroke. Although the thrombolysis should be started within 30 minutes for the best results, we realized many at times it was not happening in our casualty. The audit also revealed several factors causing the delay. So during one of the clinical audit meeting, few steps were suggested and ad to address this delay. The nurses and casualty medical officers were trained to handle such patients quickly. And it yielded the desired result as we ensured a door to needle time of less than 30 minutes. Eventually, with the timely intervention, we were able to reduce the death rate in many of acute myocardial infarction cases in our hospital. 
collecting data and analyzing it also improves our operational efficiency. Indicators like bed occupancy rate, average length of stay, OT utilization rate gives us a very clear picture how our facilities are utilized and whether there is any scope for further improvement. When we did this study, we realized that only 50% of our operation theater facility was used, utilized. To improve the utilization, we appointed new surgeons, few full-timers, few part-timers, and panel consultant. And we did a study again, and it had improved our utilization to 65%. A similar audit also was point out, pointed out that a critical care unit utilization was 100%. And further, it revealed that on an average, we were refusing four to five critically ill patients due to non-availability of bed. We recognized the need for additional ICU beds, and this was taken into consideration when we planned for expansion. We added another 23 beds in ICU. I believe that this was a very good decision as our ICU utilization rate even today uh, remains above 95%. Data also based to take decisions also enhances patient satisfaction rate. Mainly prolonged discharge times and long waiting time in OPDs and in diagnostic facilities can irritate and make patients impatient and their relatives too. Once we captured this data of average discharge time and average waiting time, we analyzed it and addressed each factor separately. The end result was we were able to reduce these waiting periods from six to three hours for discharge and from three to two hours for OPD waiting time. A sound decision taken after pulling in together available data is also aids in financial sustainability. Especially when we are planning to invest a large sum of money on capital equipment. Here I want to share my experience of purchasing a MRI in our hospital. When we were in the decision making process, our finance director made the management committee understand that we need to perform at least on an average daily 15 MRIs for four consecutive years to recover the money which we had invested. He also drew our attention to the operational cost involved in it, such as the cost for electricity, chillers, cost involved in manpower, etc. Based on our needs assessment at that time, we were anticipating only eight to 10 MRIs. That's the time we decided to write a project. And fortunately, we uh, got through a do donor who and we sanctioned the MRI installation. So even today, when we are not having such a number of MRIs, we are able to manage and meet the cost, uh, operational cost of it, even when we have 10 to 12 MRIs a day. I would like to narrate another incident wherein we deferred the plan of dialysis machine. A donor approached us to donate few dialysis machine. Again, when we were deciding, the finance department came out with a shocking data. They pointed out to us that we were already incurring a loss of about 25 lakhs of rupees annually with the existing dialysis unit. This was because a lot of people were receiving dialysis over the years were finding it difficult to pay the bills and they were given dialysis at free or concessional rate. So we put this decision on hold and we deferred the plan. Showing a good dot data in a hospital also gives us research opportunities. When we have a good and adequate data to show, we will also be able to contribute to research activity. Recently, I just want to quote two examples. The hospital was approached by, approached for two COVID-related research activity. One is a 
drug trial with Glenmark Company, and another one is a retrospective study uh, from Cardiology Society of India. Uh, this is because we were able to show a data that in the last three months, we were able to treat more than 1,000 COVID patients in our hospital. And uh, the researchers are very sure that uh, by joining hands with us, uh, they will get adequate sample size or adequate cohort for the study. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that often we take bad decisions based on instant-based assumptions. Decisions based on data is always better. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Dr. Bina. I think that was very insightful. The fact that as a practitioner, you've been able to use data for the benefit of the institution. I'm just wondering if you had chosen to go ahead with the purchase or with the receipt of the gift of the dialysis machine, you could have ended up uh, losing so much money. I think that uh, together, the four of you have touched upon so many interesting aspects in the hospital's functioning that throws up data which when you use to improve the quality of uh, decision making, it can produce so many, so much better outcomes. So at this point, I want to pause to allow participants to post their questions. The way we want to do this is that our host, Kritika, is maintaining a slide on which she's capturing the questions. And then she will put that slide up. And then I can invite any one of you to respond to that. So we will probably give a minute for the participants to post their uh, questions so that uh, Kritika can put that up on the screen. I really request all participants to ask your uh, questions. Uh, while uh, we are waiting uh, for the questions to be posted, uh, I'd like to request uh, Father Johnson, who has been listening in, to share any thoughts that he might have. Father Johnson. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. I was listening to all the four speakers, and I am so inspired through their insights on the topic. And uh, Dr. Evita and Sister Bina, both were more into their experience sharing. And uh, uh, Rohit and Dr. Vijay, more on the theoretical aspects. Two comments I like to make. One, uh, Rohit spoke about predictive analytics. You know, among the CHAI members, I am a CHAI member, you know, we have either two extremes. Either we are all, you know, not much to the data mining. We don't take data, you know, seriously, seriously. I mean, we don't find much value in that. And the, on the other hand, we would, you know, more and more to data driven approach. And we have a prejudice or bias that we are all guided only by data that might you know take us to profit and profit alone because what more income you are tend to move in that line so i as a member in the chai network i am sure that we all can have you know data analytics that can be customized according to you know, our vision especially during this COVID season, if you look at strictly at the data, you know, if you admit uh, X number of 
COVID positive patients, what is going to be the impact on the, the other patients who would come to your hospital? If you purely guided by that data, we may tend not to admit the COVID patients. So the data analytics you know, can be customized, but data should work as a foundation you know, for our approach. That is one observation that I like to make. And the second one that's uh, from Dr. Vijay. Dr. Vijay spoke about alignment of data capturing. That's again, a lot of uh, you know, insights connected to that. The chai is a network that is absolutely true, but how much we are able to align our data or taking, giving our data almost same shape. It is an extremely difficult task. All individual institutes have their own ways of collecting data. So we need some common mechanism where our data can speak to each other. They are interoperable. So what can be done you know, on that? I feel that since we are all uh, in a part of a much, much larger organization, we should have some IT in infrastructure where we all can come together, we all can pool our data, and we all can benefit from in our data. So the beginning may be in the line of starting with a hospital information system where we all can use that system. HIS would be a starting point, a common HIS. That would be a starting point in our um, growing in, the, in respect of you know, data. If we can start with a common HIS, I think that would take us quite a lot into the, the, the roadmap given by Rohit and the Dr. Vijay. So these uh, are, the, are the two uh, comments that I like to make. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Father Johnson, for, as always, putting your finger on some very crucial issues, which everyone must apply mind to. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, as I can see, there are a few questions. Uh, the questions are not many, but I think uh, very incisive questions these are. Uh, one pertains to the quality of the data itself, which is really that how can we ensure that the quality of data that we use is good. The second one pertains to the cost involved. Obviously, the uh, concern is that if we have to handle data, if we have to put data together and do stuff with it, then what is the cost involved in that? So I open it up. I mean, these are questions which perhaps could take really a long discussion on its own, but I invite the panelists to try and give quick responses to each of these uh, questions. You can see on your screen the questions that have been posed. And uh, I'm going to leave it to any of the panelists to try and uh, respond to that. So I can take a shot at that, uh, Shivatsan. And uh, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was a pleasure to listen to all the speakers. So you know, I myself have learned uh, you know, a little bit about how um, some of the hospitals are doing their work. So uh, brilliant talk by everybody else. Uh, Dr. Arundas, uh, Dr. Evita, Dr. Bina, uh, thank you very much. Um, a quick response to uh, some of these questions. Um, I think uh, the first one is something I, I feel Dr. Arundas can, you know, he already touched upon that. Uh, how do you ensure quality? I think there are two things that come to my mind. First one is uh, what Dr. Arundas said, uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, you must have an end objective in mind, um, and, and that way you can definitely ensure that what you're collecting, uh, you know, is being done for the right reasons, and hence that ensures quality of data. That's one. 
Second is something Father Johnson uh, sort of touched upon, and that is standards. That is such an underrated thing at this point in time. Uh, the quick example is this. You talked about hospital information systems, uh, Father Johnson, and uh, India being known as the country of software engineers, every hospital actually goes and makes their own hospital information systems. And what, what, what becomes difficult then is for different hospital information systems to talk to each other. So standards are extremely important to ensure that the quality of data is, is, is really cool, right? So objective of what you wanna do with the data, standards, and you know, of course, diligence in how you collect the data. I think those, to me, are the three things uh, that are uh, exceptionally needed uh, for getting good quality data. Thanks, Rohit. Uh, anyone of the others, uh, would you like to try and respond to that? Mm, yeah, if I can respond to the quality question first, uh, and I appreciate the question because it's something which I struggle with uh, regularly. Uh, is looking at the question, um, data shared may be false, incorrect, or not relevant. What I tend to do is to go back to the point where it's collected and understand how it's being collected. Unfortunately, a lot of it is passed on from person to person on how it's collected. And even going down the line, that might change sometimes. Just uh, today, I got a call about a particular form which was being filled. And um, the person who coordinates it said, look, the data has stopped coming in. These are not ticked. So I talked to the person who's done it and they were handed over an instruction saying, do not pick these columns. So for the last three weeks, that form has been going without the data. So it's very true it happens. We need to go back to the base of where the data is collected and we need to have written instructions on what data is to be captured. If the data is from a computer, we need to write down which field in the computer. And if we find there's a problem, I've also then gone back to the computer itself to understand where is it picking up its data from. And I found in this elaborate software, which we developed over years, that discharge date and time from four different modules were saying four different things. And when I went back to the programmers, I understood exactly why. It was done very logically. The problem was the labeling was discharge time and date for all four, while well, actually they were not so. So you need to really go back to see where the data is captured, what is the label, and then how, what are the chances of it being incorrect at the data capture point? And quite often it may not be there. The relevance depends on understanding what you're using that indicator for. And if it's, you have to match that rationale with what it's actually being used to interpret. And um, when do you check this? I think you check it when you have a doubt as to whether that indicator is really showing you the data which you think should, should be showing. And if you're finding there are some deviations, then you would look more greater. But a good way to clean up is just to write down protocols for each indicator to say, this is what the scope is, this is how it's captured from this point by this person. And so that then becomes a recorded standard operating procedure. Yeah, thanks, Vijay. Uh, the other big one, the big animal here is the cost involved in being able to deal with all that data. Uh, clearly, there is need to have uh, software. And uh, would any of you try to take a shot at this uh, in terms of uh, how do you deal with the costs involved in managing data? Um, okay, let me take the plunge on this one. This is a tough one. Okay. A um, couple of things say at the beginning. Our software requirements keep changing as we grow and as we learn better how to deal with software. So what we think is good for us now may not be good for us five years down the line, depending on where the situation is. The software requirement for a large institution like Rajshri will be very different from one for a smaller place. And so it may not be, it may be difficult for all to fit onto the same platform simply because it's meant for different things. So given a situation where I'm in a hospital where the software is okay, but I'm not able to get the data analysis I want, I would say most often one is able to download data which one can then analyze. 
So if that download facility is there, pull it down into some other into Excel, into database and do analysis to leverage the data while letting the software run as long as it runs. Um, I think changing software should come in only when one needs to with a good understanding of what one's specifications are and then moving in there, not just because you know, I want to get better data out of it. It must fit in with the core work of the hospital, the clinical work, the lab work, the admin work to be able to make it worth the change. 